This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chattels. So a chattel is what's known as a tangible, in other words, you can touch it, movable, what it says it is, asset. Now, a wasting chattel, one that has a life of less than 50 years or less. And examples, racehorses, greyhounds and yachts. Now, you'll think, well, that's an unusual connection. Well, that's because these have all been sorted through legal cases as to what is and what isn't a wasting chattel. Thankfully, you don't have to know what is and what isn't. You just have to know the rules of how you work out the tax. Um, planter machinery um, treated as non-wasting assets. They rarely come up. They rarely come up. You're not going to have to deal with those. Now, a non-wasting asset, a non-wasting chattel, um, estimated remaining life of more than 50 years, and there are special rules for those. Okay. They are called anti-avoidance rules. So I'll give you an example. Um, say you'd got a massive capital gain. And as you've seen from earlier in the chapter, that um, you can offset the current year losses against that gain. And you may have chattels non-wasting chattels that you want to dispose of and you sell them at a price less than they are worth in order to make losses to set them off because you know that the rule says that current year losses can be set off against current year gains. So these are anti-avoidance rules uh, and legislation. So I'm going to, I'm going to also, I'm just going to draw this out You've got the information in front of you, but I'm going to draw it out so that you can see it because this is the way um, I, I was taught how to do it. And I, I find it much easier to understand. And hopefully you do, because then now you've got both ways of doing it. So. Under six. Over six. So that's the cost. Under six. over six and this is the proceeds and that's your cost so if everything the proceeds and the cost are under six then it's exempt now that means that most people will never pay capital gains tax on on their assets because most of us own chattels apart from a house which is has its own special rules most of the assets that we own cameras bikes pedal bikes furniture um all of those things are our chattels um and if we sell them we could be potentially a chargeable person with a chargeable asset chargeably disposing of it which is what we had at the beginning of the chapter but if it's all under six it's exempt which is why most people never in their lifetime pay capital gains tax because they own a house which is exempt under certain rules a car which is exempt anyway and chattels which if they're under six are exempt now if everything is over six it's outside the scope of uh, the chattels rules and then it would be the normal um, CGT computation, which is the proceeds less the cost equals the gain, which we've dealt with before. So you own a very, very expensive camera, which a Hasselblad, for example, which are worth 30, 40,000 pounds, and you pay 20 for it, then proceeds less cost equals gain. Now, if the proceeds are over six and the cost was under six, then we have what's known, we just do a normal computation. So the proceeds, let's go for a, a, a nice round figure. Cost four. Okay, so we made a gain of four. 
Now, the chattel rules allow you to reduce that gain. So you do then a second computation where the proceeds are the same, but the cost is deemed to be 6, which gives us a gain of 2 which we then multiply by 5 thirds, which gives us an answer of 3, 3, 3, 3. Now you have a choice of which one you want, and I'm sure that one you would choose because it's less than 4. So you are allowed under these chattel rules, if you make a profit, to reduce that profit by doing the second calculation. But do both calculations. If you're unsure, do the normal calculation. You will get merit marks for that and then you have to learn the rule which says that the cost is deemed to be six multiplied by the gain is then multiplied by five thirds now the other way round if the costs are over six and the proceeds are under six you're going to make a loss so if we go for proceeds let's keep the same sort of numbers cost of eight we made a loss of four and in that situation, do the normal calculation. That's the normal calculation. Proceeds less cost equals gain, in this case, a loss. Now, this also has a deemed figure in it. The proceeds are deemed to be 6. The cost is then 8, which means the loss has now been reduced to 2. And that is the one that you would have to use, the smaller one. So on the one hand, they're saying that you can reduce your gains and pay less tax. But on the other hand, which is where the anti-avoidance comes in, they're saying if you're making losses, you've got to reduce the loss as well. Right. So those are very specific uh, rules and regulations that you will need to um, spend time learning. Now, there again here, this is in a written format. That's in a written format. Okay, so let's have a look at question number 10, example number 10, to see what rules we need to apply in various different sections. So JM sold the following assets. An antique table which cost £3,000 in February 2016, he sold it for five. Can you remember which box that's going to go in? Okay. Now, a painting which had cost two and now has been sold for ten. Okay, which box will that go in? A vase which cost eight, sold for three. That's going to make a loss, so we know which box that one goes in. And a vintage car, which costs seven. The word in that question you need to be looking at is that one. Okay, it is exempt. Okay, now also, did you get these right? So this top one is also exempt because it's all under that limit. So how many calculations are we actually going to have to do? We're only going to have to do two calculations out of four. Don't ignore A or D. Tell the examiner why the table is exempt. Tell the examiner why the car is exempt and then do two calculations. Okay, don't ignore things that are exempt. You know the rule, put the rule down, apply it to the question, you will get marks for that. So let's have a look at example number 10. And again, here you can see the table is exempt because cost and proceeds are all under six. And at the bottom, the car is exempt. Two calculations then. The painting 
okay I asked you to do if you were making a, pro, a, a, um, a gain to do the normal calculation proceeds less cost equals gain then you do it again it's written on the bottom there but I'll show you how it works okay because that's deemed now do you remember which means the gain is now that times five thirds equals six 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 seven which is the figure you would choose the vase was a loss now the the vase this is the deemed proceeds that's been put in there if you want to put in the normal calculation first that's not a problem then you need to bring everything together that's exempt remember so is that one gain on the what was it painting that's it painting and the loss current year gains current year losses netted off together that is the net chargeable gains which would be covered by the annual exempt amount so there would be no tax due okay other wasting assets now these are rare I'd rather you spent time doing what we've just done with chattels than learning how to do this one okay so the allowable expenditure wastes over a straight line basis over the lifetime of the asset um, when a disposal is made the allowable expenditure is restricted to take account of the assets natural fall in value which is a straight line basis as it says there and you've got here the rules therefore to compute the cost the original cost must be reduced by P over L times C minus S, where P is the period of the ownership of the seller, L is the predictable life of the asset, and C is the cost, and S is the scrap value. Let's have a look at example number 11. So on the 1st of December, 2010 he bought a copyright at a cost of 25,000 estimated useful life okay predicted life of the asset so that figure is going to go that's that one 30 now how long have we owned it let's have a look so we sold it in 2022 so we'd owned it for 12 years which is that figure. So we've got 12 over 30 as a result of that. We multiply that by the cost, which was 25,000, less the scrap value, residual value there is 1,000. Okay, so that's where we get all the figures from. Can you see where we get all those figures from? So the estimated useful life, L, is 30 years. We'd owned it for 12 because we bought it then and sold it then. So that's the figure that goes on the top. So 12 thirtieths. The cost we've got from the question and the residual value we've got from the question. Let's have a look what the example shows us there. You see all those calculations? 12 over 30, P over L times C minus S, the cost minus the scrap value. So the proceeds were given to us in the question. That's the original cost. And we have to take an account of the fact that it will waste over that straight line basis. So the only cost we can have against it is 15,400, which then gives us a gain of 22,000.
and 600. As I said, they are rare, but if you can remember P, L, C and S, well done. Now, new rules were brought into um, play regarding uh, residential properties. So normally, uh, CGT is due on the 31st of January in the year after. So for 2022-23, that would be January 24. However, the revenue want tax paid on account within 30 days of the disposal of a residential property. Now, in order to work that out, you need to compute any current tax year capital losses included prior to the property disposal, the annual exempt amount for the year and any losses brought forward. Now it is always going to be an estimate because at that stage, especially if you do it right at the beginning of the tax year, when you haven't got any losses brought forward because you haven't sold anything else, um, and you don't know how much income tax you're going to pay and how much basic rate band you've got left. So you can't even do an estimate of that. So that's always going to be the case. You would then make the payment on account and then later the numbers would all be um, recalculated. And there's an example, an illustration here. So let's have a look at the illustration. So Lee is a high rate taxpayer. Ooh, big hint. Take the hints. Don't spend time working out what, how much basic rate band there is left. There's no need. They've told you he's a high rate taxpayer. So it's either 20 or 28%. Made the following disposals. Um, May 2022, gain of 22,500 on the disposal of a painting. It's been done for you. That's the answer. A loss of six on the, some shares in July. In October, again on a residential property, so payments on account due. So when you're reading questions, that these sort of things should be popping in your mind. Then the loss on some sale of shares in January. We've got to work out the amount of CGT payable, stating what payments must be made and the dates. Now, they're not telling you you've got to make payments on account, but they are hinting, okay, what payments must be made. In other words, there must be more than one, a payment on account, and the 31st of January, and the dates. Okay, payments on account are made 30 days after the residential properties are sold. So, as the property was sold on the 31st of October, we got to do a payment on account. Write that out. It is the rule and the examiner expects you to know the rule, write it out, and then what you've done here is you've applied it. So, proceeds. Oh, wait a minute. Payments on account, sorry. Gain on the property, less the loss brought forward, because that happened before, less the annual exempt amount, gives you a gain, taxed at that because... The question told you was high rate. That is your payment on account. And that is the date that it's due. Now, in January 2024, we've got to work out the rest of the capital gains. So that's just to work out the payments on account. That's not what goes on the tax return. This is what goes on the tax return. That was just to work out payments on account. So this is the final situation. We've got the residential property and we've got a, which is in a separate column. Why? It's in a column on its own because it's taxed at a different rate. Do you remember that from before? Other gains. The losses all go here because this is taxed at 28% and this at 20%. So let's reduce the highest taxable amount 
we can. So put those in there, the losses, both of them now, and the annual exempt amount. That's going to be taxed at 28%, and this is going to be taxed at 20%. Add the two of them together, these two, so that's the 28%, and that's the 20%. Now he's paid payment on account. That's the payment on account. This is now due on the 31st of the 1st, 24. That could come up in a question because there's a lot of rules and regulations, a lot of hints, and a lot of not telling you what you've got to do, expecting you to know the rules and how to work them out. Okay, You may need to go through that illustration again. So we've come to the end of the chapter and the two practice questions are practice question 24 and 25. And then we can move on to the second chapter on capital gains tax. You should be watching them in order.